Okay. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Yeah. It works. Um, I'm delighted to welcome my friend Boshan Vidamshok to a mm -hmm. um, an interview that will give the illusion of professionalism. We're both in our pajamas. We may or may not be wearing pants, um, but <laughs> we we have important things to discuss. <laughs> so, um, Boshan, how's it going today? What What was your day like? Ooh, hi Milan, hi everybody else. Uh, a long sitcom day. I had a kind of, how to say, lecture at one big Slovenian company about the future of climate crisis, but writing in the morning about uh, a guy in Copenhagen who built Colosseum from uh, Lego cubes. So, uh, it's, it's okay. So, uh, um, David Epstein would call it the generalization, you know, I'm trying to run away from hyper specialization and this is the result, writing about everything during the Corona crisis, because I'm here yeah. again, you know, I'm not traveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't have to put on pants anymore, so this is the, the benefit and the, the disadvantage of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, today yeah. we're going to talk primarily about your new book, Plan B. I this have is the, the English version. version. It's waiting for you. Ah, the English oh. version. Oh, super. Okay. Well, we like it so much. We have two of the Slovenian <laughs> ones. Um, so it, I, I recommend to all of you Vidumshuk collectors out there that you get at least two copies of each book. Support the Bosch and Vidumshuk Retirement Fund. And while I'm here, I'm going to just plug his two other books that I've read, um, oh. which are Wonderful Dispatches from the Front Lines of Humanity, a book of reportage and 21st Century Conflicts, The Remnants of War. Um, you have other books, but those are the ones that are in English to date. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. It's six of so, them all together. So, yeah. so let's, let's go straight into Plan B. And mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to start by giving the elevator pitch. How would you describe it to someone um, between the first and seventh floors uh, when they're trapped in the elevator with you in a way that they must go out and buy it immediately by the time the doors open. No should pressure. We, should we wear the masks or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, imagine it's another year. <laughs> All right, so um, we don't have much time, so let's do with this time what we can. Uh, I wrote a book, it's called Plan B, and I'm trying to present the best already exist, existing, existing projects and practices in the fight with the climate crisis. So together with the photographer, Matthias Krivitz, an award-winning photographer, we went around the world. We, find very, we found very interesting men and women who are trying to do their best to solve the climate crisis as much as, possible, as it is in their hands. Uh, I'm trying to mix technology with sociology. Um, trying to say or write that um, uh, technology as such is an empty shell if it's not filled uh, with the right paradigmatic change in the society. So uh, the collection of stories is based exactly on this. This is the first part is pioneers of the fight with the climate crisis. And the second part of the, the, the book, it's uh, rather different. It's called Lithium Road. And it's a part of one gram of lithium carbonate from Boli high up in the Bolivian Andes. Uh, Andes. To, to the Chinese electric car factories and lithium battery assemblies and all around the globe also following what is going on with the lithium trade, uh, which is now 60% dominated in production and in, on the market uh, by China. And I'm trying to put the story in the geostrategical, geostrategical context. And altogether, it's uh, also a message that things which look green and are proclaimed uh, to be green uh, are not necessarily green. So uh, it, the book, I think, has a critical distance, but it's, in my opinion, a piece of literal journalism. Uh, it also in, uh, includes lots of personal observations and, of course, opinions. We've already gone past the seventh floor, but we're still there with you. And we decided to go all the way to the penthouse and come back down because <laughs> you held our interest <laughs> in the elevator pitch. Um, so let's divide this into two parts. So we want to talk about the, the plan B uh, opening section, and we'll talk about the lithium separately. Um, let's begin with the lithium, actually, because I love the idea that you're following a specific um, object, or um, in this case, um, uh, a chemical that is uh, 
passing through all these various hands and being transformed and turned into um, the the core of it is that it goes into rechargeable batteries. Is that, is that the the sort of raison d'être of, of lithium in technology? Kind of. I mean, it's a driving force, as I call it, of 21st century. It's present everywhere in our mobile phones, in solar panels, in the, in the game, uh, in the, all the gaming machines, uh, in mm -hmm. all the computers, laptops, and also it's the main uh, the main content of the electric battery, uh, battery for the electric cars. So lithium carbonate mm -hmm. is the thing right now and it's uh, out there on the market. The market is super volatile and it has very strong uh, political, geopolitical uh, consequences, especially in the relations between US and China or vice versa. So uh, it's a super interesting thing. It involves, it involves lots of dirty practices, I would call, the, call it the dirty or bloody mineral. I mean, uh, not necessarily lithium itself, but uh, cobalt, which is the second thing, thing, second mineral included in the, in the lit lithium ion battery and in the production of electric cars. 70% uh, of cobalt is, uh, is mined in, uh, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and most of it is in the war zones. So, it's really bloody, collected by children and fought uh, by, by children militias. And uh, uh, it's part of my previous war correspondent career. I mean, I've made a lot of stories in Congo and it was definitely one of my most traumatic uh, experiences. So I'm trying to always to put things kind of in a wider context, but uh, I see this book also as some kind of, I don't know, is not just, another but a rather longer chapter in the uh, front line of humanity, but not only humanity, of the whole eco ecosystems. Yeah. Now, it's important for people who are unfamiliar with your work to know, and I'm gonna, gonna do the thing that Slovenes don't like to pat themselves on the back, so they let their American friends do it for them, because we, we have no, no such problems patting people or ourselves mm -hmm. on the back. So um, Boshan <laughs> is a superhero. Um, and he is um, part of a sort of uh, romantic endangered species called the war reporter. Um, and he travels as a foreign correspondent to conflict zones. Um, and he uh, has been reporting on them for major newspapers for a very long time. Um, and, uh, and maybe you want to tell us just a little bit about, you mentioned that you kind of got, got burned out um, with... Uh, so much, so many negative stories about people, and you wanted to shift gears to a new focus, a new front line. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. Exactly. I mean, it's been 20 plus, 20 odd years of war reporting and crisis reporting, you know, since the, the last days, I would call them, of ex Yugoslavian or Balkan wars till uh, yesterday, you know, and uh, I've been everywhere, from Somalia to Afghanistan, from Iraq to Gaza, from Lebanon to Syria, from Libya to Darfur, from DR Congo to name it, you know, all, all these years. And it has, of course, it's been a very, very, uh, very strong experience, it, but it, also, it was somehow also an adventure. Uh, it was a gift that I could be a witness of history, of historic events, also in Arab Spring and other, uh, other, other, other stories. But it has also been really traumatic and frustrating, especially after the 9-11. Uh, not because of the 9-11 itself, but because of the fact that not a single bigger conflict or crisis which occurred after 9-11 stopped. The war in Iraq is going on. Afghanistan is an open front and it's gonna get worse after the American, uh, Americans go out, even if it's an oxymoron in my geopolitical terms. So uh, not to mention Syria, not to mention Yemen. Uh, of course, there's Libya and uh, there are new conflicts coming in and these are, I, I call them forever wars. And to be a correspondent and to a war correspondent and to get old, uh, in conflicts like that, I mean, but on the at the end of the day, there is only cynicism and frustration, and and uh, it's also a repetition. It's a vicious circle, and 
just telling the same stories all over again to to more or less the same public it's it's bullshit you know and uh, after coming back from mosul um in late 2016 uh, after following the 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 war with the Islamic State, uh, with ISIS, uh, on this on this side of the Iraqi government forces, uh, I was really on one side tired, and on, on the other side, really, how to say, I mean, I've made my decision to 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 to, to not to change uh, the profession, but to change the, the the path, or I don't know where I will go next, you know. So I didn't want to go to the next front line. So uh, a photographer, a friend of mine, Matthias, called me and just uh, called me, let's have a coffee and uh, uh, gave me an elevator pitch, you know, to put you. So, <laughs> and it was super successful. We didn't even move from the mezzanine, you know. So, <laughs> and the next thing was we bought tickets uh, to Bolivia and we started the, 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 the story. And it's, uh, it has been four years now. Uh, a long project, it's an ongoing project, it's, I don't know, present continuous, it's activity in progress. So plan B as a book, it's just a beginning, in my opinion, let's see what the publishers will have to say of what kind of theology, you know, I, I already see the next chapter and the next, the next book, but the Corona crisis, of course, uh, grounded yeah. us down. And now we are in the huge waiting room and not only us, everybody who's uh, in this profession, or uh, and uh, we're waiting for doors to open to, to to continue with our work. Now, was it self-evident that you would choose lithium as the focus, or did that come out of a discussion? Uh, lithium, as such, was not self-evident, but climate crisis um, and reporting and writing about climate crisis was because following the conflicts. I, um, I have really noticed first time, for example, in Darfur in, I don't know, September, October 2004, that the climate crisis and the consequences for local communities uh, are the, the, the main force or the driving force behind the conflict, you know, and uh, I've seen it then also in Syria and uh, northern Iraq, we can mention Yemen here, places which are super dry, super hot, and uh, are the main sources of armed conflicts right now will be in the future, the whole Sahel, the Middle East, and in the same time, these places are really suffering uh, due to the consequences of climate change. So, uh, and there is only one thing to say, it's only gonna get worse, worse. So, uh, and I wanted to, to touch or to write about um, the source of the troubles. I think this is also a job, of, a job to do as if you are a journalist. But on the other hand, I was also sick of just describing the tragedies uh, because the level of empathy in public has fallen down. I mean, has shrinked uh, the focus um, is not there, uh, not only due to the social media, but the, the overflow of information, internet and everything, the, the, the role of media, the traditional media, the mainstream media has changed or in some places, uh, you know, it's not existing anymore. So I have decided to focus my work. I call it uh, solution-driven journalism on the constructive journalism. Uh, not just to, 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 to open questions, uh, to, to put questions out, which is our job, also to offer, if possible, with my knowledge, experience, and age. <laughs> uh, is it wisdom? Uh, to, offer some, to offer some answers. And uh, it was really nice uh, being out there, meeting people who know a million times more about things than we do, and uh, uh, meeting very inspiring people and communities which have decided that they've had enough of bullshit and waiting and they they went out there and confront the situation and they were uh, they were and they are super successful and with this book i'm trying to how to say copy paste or applicate the, the, their stories to to 
not only to Slovenia, but to, 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 to global public. I mean, there are solutions out there which could be super useful here and now, and they're not, I don't know, science fiction based or super expensive. You don't need space technology for it, and you just need uh, motivated communities, political will, or some kind of con political consensus, and very talented uh, technocrats uh, to suck the, I don't know, in European case, the Green New Deal European money out from Brussels and to use it for ethic purposes. It's fucking simple, man. <laughs> so I want to get into some of the discoveries you, you made, but um, first, maybe the obvious question that um, people are afraid to ask is, so you've come up with a variety of avenues for plan B. What was plan A and was it actually ever a plan or did it just come up organically that's the way it played out um on one hand it's a uh, word play you know because with this bill mckibben uh and the other environmentalists saying that there is no planet b there's no planet b and greta coming in and saying there's no planet b all right there no there's no planet b but maybe we can have a plan b here and now because the plan a uh just growing and growing and spending and using the resources um, over over all possible limits, over expanding our presence on Earth and over expanding our horn, horniness, I would say, uh, is leading us to an, a super obvious disaster. And uh, that was the plan A, to, 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 to have this uh, Romanesque party till the end of the day, you know, but the end of the day is coming faster than anybody expected. The, the Arctic ice uh, is melting 10 times faster than the biggest pessimists five years ago were doing the day in advance. So on the other hand, uh, this summer uh, has really been, uh, oh, this is actually on the same end, <laughs> uh, to put it literally, uh, in this, this summer has been exceptionally hot uh, in the Arctic. Whatever happens in the north does not stay in the north. It affects the weather patterns, it affects the torrents, it affects everything. And there is this city in Siberia called Verkhoyansk. Maybe you heard about it. And uh, on 20 of June this year, um, I think it was 37.8 degrees Celsius during the day. But this is really high up north in Siberia. And this same city, it's still uh, first on the list of the cities or places with the lowest ever temperature in Northern Hemisphere. In, nine, in 1892, um, they've recorded 86, min minus 86 Celsius. So it's 115, 106, I don't know, uh, change Celsius degrees. And that's something, and it was not a rare event to be that hot, it was for weeks. And at the same time, permafrost was melting. And at the same time, Maiden, uh, CH4 was coming out of the ground, which is much more dangerous than uh, CO2. So yes, it's a clusterfuck. And, uh, um, but it gets, re one gets bored or frustrated listening to, 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 to the numbers and to these horrible stories and prediction what is coming. There is a lot of data out there. And obviously we in the geographically privileged areas, let's say the Central Europe is one of them, if not one of most of the, the most privileged places, especially Slovenia. Uh, we cannot react. We are impotent here because, and now I sound like Slavo, impotent. This is Zizek style, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, because, uh, to, to quote somehow or paraphrase uh, Daniel Kahneman, we are not evolutionary, we are not wired to react uh, to a very far or exotic or abstract danger. Uh, we are uh, wired only to react to clear and present danger, like trying to, not on Zoom, but trying to stick a finger in your eye. Or, uh, I don't know, seeing a car driving 200 kilometers per hour in my direction, of course I would, as a reflex, react. We have reflexes, uh, re reflexes but we don't have capacity for reflection for self-reflection or collective reflection, which is the key in the fight with climate crisis. 
the and uh, if you look at the map you see that societies which are most endangered by the all, already present climate change and changed weather patterns are reacting and uh, um, I mean somehow or sometimes I get response that uh, countries some of the countries in mentioned in the book some of the practices mentioned in this book are really rich like Norway or Switzerland but this, or, or somehow or also also Iceland but these countries are already suffering uh, due to the climate crisis uh, they, they, they see with their own eyes they feel with their own feet walking that the glaciers are me melting that the weather is different that there is no more snow that uh, <laughs> there are no the four seasons quattro stagioni has become due stagioni and it, things are really changing fast and that's why they are reacting it's not only about money money comes and the reactions also comes with the maturity of the society i mean norway of course as a case which i also presented the book was built on the oil money on the big oil money uh, but uh, norway is in my opinion i don't consider us as democratic state anymore or a bit more than a month ago <laughs> though uh, um, is the only functioning all democracy and it could easily become a new Kuwait, Bahrain or United Arab Emirates but it uh, uh, but Norway has become uh, for considering the the, 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 the the competition out there a rather egalitarian democratic modern progressive state with the help of oil money and this oil money and the old story could go on because they have enormous enormous uh, oil reserves uh, down there in the Barents Sea and in the northern sea, the, the north nor, north sea but what are they doing they're investing the oil money into green technologies of course it's called greenwashing even their main the main state oil company stat oil has changed its name to equinor which really sounds like we're doing something special now from science to technology everything goes together but this money also from the pension fund you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation is being really used in a proper way. I mean, in 2012, all the, all the main players in Norwegian politics uh, had a meeting, they were all around one table and they said, okay, climate change is uh, real. We're fucked if we don't react. This is not about the ideology. This is not about our political or personal differences. Let's react. And they, re they, they have reacted and uh, Two years ago, uh, in, I think it was October 2018, uh, this was the first month in Norwegian or European or world history where uh, when more than 50% of all the car sales in Norway were uh, electric cars, electric vehicles. Uh, this year, at the end of 2020, it's going to be the first year uh, where when the electric vehicles will dominate the market. They have also electrified a big part of their ferry uh, ferry traffic, uh, sea travel, uh, and until 2040, they will fully electrify uh, the the, the uh, air travel also, but only the inner lines, the, the, the internal lines. And they're doing many things, and it's of course it's black energy, uh, black money invested in green energies. Uh, I don't see much wrong with that. I mean, we can say okay fuck you, you're rich, you have oil. Yeah, but this oil could produce Kuwait, and, but it has produced a very social, very open, progressive, libertarian and liberal country. So if we're looking back historically, we've actually had a few different phases to consider. This, this is probably plan, plan D, if we're, if we're being historically accurate. So the, for the first one would surely have been the Industrial Revolution and everything based on coal, which was uh, uh, had very visual lifestyle repercussions, um, particularly really thinking of things like the, um, the fog that descended over cities famously like London based on these extremities of pollution and spewing um, uh, pollution into the air. And then there was a shift towards nuclear energy, which was supposed to be clean and nice and lovely, but also had some problems related to it. Um, and now we have a shift towards uh, a hyper focus on electric, which sounds very good, but your investigation highlights some elements of it that um, are not 
quite as clean and rosy as they appear. Have I missed any step along the sort of giant energy system story that you want to fill in? Uh, not, not, no, you didn't, because uh, to quote one of my sources, uh, a, German, a German doctor, a scientist, uh, Ina Handorf, uh, the European and also the American legislation uh, uh, considering energy, energy legislation has been written in the times of industrial revolution. So, and it's still there. So uh, nothing, I mean, uh, what we are entering now or penetrating is actually a transition period. I don't think that the, I mean, it's not only my opinion, uh, that uh, electric cars or, electric, or electrifying the traffic, which is, which only produces one third of the emissions. I mean, it's not only about traffic and electric vehicles. This is just one thing. And it, because the, most of the electric cars look like gadgets, we are kind of sexually attracted to it. You know, it's uh, also a consumer, a huge consumer market. You know, it's, uh, that's why I'm not putting it in the first place, definitely. But uh, um, there are many, many, many things uh, which are being developed, research now, and uh, electric cars and electrifying the traffic, as I say, it's not only my opinion, just a transition and we will see something new in uh, three to five or 10 years. But uh, plan C, not D, you know, it's, I mean, as a continu continuum of uh, plan B in, in, uh, in our case as a project, it's uh, nuclear fusion, not fusion, okay. nuclear fusion. It's uh, till this summer, it was rather quiet. I mean, in the mainstream or in the wider public, it was not really known. There were some rumors that something is going on somewhere. Uh, but it's, of course, it has been invented in the 50s and in the 60s. It was connected with the H hydrogen bomb. Uh, it had a very bad reputation, obviously. Uh, but uh, at the end of Cold War, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan sat down in Geneva and said, okay, now we're gonna use our common knowledge to do something good for uh, the coming generations. It's been now 36, for 35 years, it's, it takes a long time, uh, but in Provence, in France, um, there is a very, very promising project called ITER, uh, International uh, Thermofusion Project. It's, uh, it involves 35 countries, including US, European Union, China, Japan, uh, South Korea. And uh, it's been slow for first couple of years, but in last two years, I mean, it's going fast forward. Uh, we've been there six weeks ago and uh, it's super promising it's gonna take some years but with the nuclear fusion fusion is a process uh, going on permanently in on, on the sun and in all the stars uh, producing plasma and uh, this is what they're trying to achieve trying to do in uh, these huge tokamak uh, reactors and if they're gonna be successful and all the signs are that they are already being successful that in 20 years maybe it's a long time to say i mean especially now uh, it's very hard to imagine what will happen in all these years but in 20 years we will have abundance of free energy if we if the scientists will have free hands and uh, the, the 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 global community will be ready to to financially support the project which will cost not more than $25 billion at the end. Uh, and comparing to some spendings out there, it's nothing. It's much less than the US spent for uh, training and the equipment of the Afghan, uh, for example, for the Afghan uh, security forces, police and mili the military combined. And they're after 19 years of training, they're unable to fight the Taliban or the Khorasan, the local franchise of Islamic State. So yes, nuclear fusion, fusion could be the answer. But do we have time to dream? Do we have time to wait? I'm not really sure. Especially so because we have to grab the attention, you know, and the out, right now, out there, there is not much attention. The pandemics took it all or nearly all. It's a monoculture of bullshit now, and uh, it's super dangerous. And with this idea that, okay, we have dolphins in Venice, 
uh, we, we can see uh, Himalaya from New Delhi. Uh, oh, in Kathmandu, the, the sky is blue. It sounds like, it sounds like a pun now, <laughs> not intentionally, uh, but that's bullshit. This is selling the illusion. Uh, the, 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 the Hawaiian, you have this CO2 measurement in Hawaii up in the mountains. And this year it's already uh, 411.3 per million uh, pieces per million uh, uh, CEO uh, to uh, last year it was 408. So it's growing rapidly and you cannot stop it. You know, the only way is to cut, cut the use of energy, you know, to go down, so not the, to spend that much. The case studies in this book are, I mean, your ideal readers would be potential policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, what can someone who is just um, uh, an ordinary person trying to be conscientious and do whatever little part they can do to contribute to um, a better way forward? Um, I'm thinking in terms of do you, do you, should everybody be getting hybrid cars or stop eating beef and these sort of things that an individual person can do that would be, if enough individual people did, it would make some collective good. I mean, the first thing is to be an active citizen, you know, not to, not to uh, blame, not to play the, the, not to play the blame game. I mean, to get involved. Uh, of course, stop eating beef for me it would be great. Saying this as a vegetarian, it's uh, not really objective. Uh, um, of course, driving electric cars would be better than to drive the old diesel shit. Uh, of course, it would be good to do to, to, to all the proper waste management. Uh, of course, it would be good to, to spend less, to buy less, to, to, to start believing in the dogma of uh, growth of permanent uh, spending and investing. Uh, but the thing is that out there it looks too big. You get scared, you get scared, you get frustrated. I cannot do anything. And then what you do at the end of the day, you just, I don't know how to put it in English. Uh, you just, it's kind of going to church and putting, I don't know, uh, five cents and I did my job, you know, and uh, it's kind of, um, personal greenwashing, you know, just to, to do something and then to leave uh, things to the others to, to fix it, for, to fix them. It's not going to work like that and it's not working like that. Uh, it also, the, the, you need a political consensus. Um, that's why I'm trying to, 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 <laughs> to invest myself uh, and step out of the comfort zone and uh, to be kind of involved also in policy making, you know, through, mm -hmm. through, through yeah. European young leaders, through the presidential, uh, through presidential uh, board of advisors, through, through European climate pact ambassadors. And I mean, to offer whatever you can, you know, but of course it's important to, 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 to change the lifestyle and the social and sociological and economical paradigm. But this, for, for a, a single person, this is too much to hear. Uh, not, not, and much, 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 too much, much of the much is to do, to react. So uh, little steps, small steps. On the other hand, in plan B in the book, it's not only for policymakers, it's also for you and me. It's also for uh, active citizens around the world uh, because it's, it's, it's a study case how things should be done. And uh, mostly it's grassroots movement, not, not movements. It sounds too political or too activistic. It's people on the islands, I don't know, in Tilos in Greece, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Iceland, or also in Norway, or some people in, I don't know, some young uh, businessman, client works in Switzerland, which have decided that they have had enough, had enough and they will do something, whatever they can, you know? And they put together all the knowledge, resources, and uh, build the local communities, uh, prove that things could be done successfully. And uh, these cases could be applied from carbon capture and storage, from direct air ca capture, uh, from, I don't know, first Mediterranean um, 
energy self-sustaining, 100% self-sustainable island of Delos to, to other places. It's not science fiction. It's here to be, it's here, it's here now, it's to be used, you know, like an open source. And it, it's a very optimistic book. And I think hearing you talk about the issues, it could sound potentially, um, I think you're pessimistic, but the book is very optimistic. Is that safe to say? Yes, it's <laughs> so the definition it's, it's of one... a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but this is something that, that is uplifting to read because you can see that people have had great ideas and they're working. And so the question is whether other people will pick up on them and continue. Um, maybe just to put in one of the stories. So, um, so to whet people's appetite, maybe you could tell us what the really interesting photograph on the uh -huh. cover is of and maybe that story. It looks like a Jules Verne, Jules Verne portal to the underworld, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does indeed. Yeah. These, these are the Orkney Islands, uh, northwestern Scotland. Uh, Orkney Islands are the, cent are the epicenter of the European Center of Marine uh, Sea Energy. And this machine particularly, it's... Uh, uh, it, it harnesses the, 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 the energy from tide, it's tidal machine, and it's one of the already existing working and it's going to industrial level production soon. Uh, it's one of the, one of the, one of the machines, uh, the apparatus, uh, which are being tested there. Uh, Orkney Islands have a brilliant combination of tidal and waves energy. Uh, they have permanent super strong wind and seven to eight meters, even seven, eight meters permanently high uh, waves. So uh, a group of scientists and businessmen went there in the early years of this millennium. And uh, they have created, uh, I mean, they found out that uh, they could really change the area and use it as a kind of open research center, open lab, open laboratorium. And uh, in a couple of years, a lot of money has been invested there, also from, from Silicon Valley to Chinese, from the European Union to, I don't know, some um, anonymous uh, investors, but from big companies. And uh, very soon uh, they have opened two to, to, to universities uh, uh, related to uh, Meran, Meran energy to, to see to see power and a lot of scientists, a lot of young enthusiasts uh, came to the islands. The islands which were kind of forgotten or behind the gods back for decades, if not uh, if not uh, um, centuries, uh, have, be, have become the place with the uh, it's the source here is BBC the the place which has for the last three years the best quality of life in Great Britain. Mm. And uh, um, they have built around 800 wind farms, small wind farms, and the whole local, uh, all the farms, all the, all the agriculture is run by renewable energy, locally produced through renewable energy, um, not even using the, the marine energy uh, because it's still in the, in the research phase. Uh, they already produce from 130 to 150 percent of energy they need. So the, 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 the surplus of energy they invest or put in uh, production of, it's very, very expensive production, but if they produce their own energy, it's not, it's actually cheap, it's for free. They produce green hydrogen uh, uh, cells and they're already using the green hydrogen cells uh, for, uh, for their ferries, for their local traffic, uh, and things are gonna get bigger and bigger, I suppose. Of course, the Brexit has had an impact, but it was not as bad as they predicted that it would be. Uh, of course, pandemics has its effects and effects on the, on the story, but Orkney Islands are, in my opinion, something to be closely observed because they really can make a change. And uh, it's also interesting how a kind of conservative closed society, it's an island very far off, uh, island society, uh, has opened itself, uh, has been super welcoming to people coming in from all over the world. 
and it has been transformed to uh, technology geeks and uh, people who really love new things, you know. And uh, you go for a beer in a local pub, you don't talk about football, you talk about the next title machine, you know. And uh, it's sexy, it's nice, it's beautiful, you know. And this is why the book has this optimistic uh, atmosphere, because people um, I spoke to, people are, who are there, are super optimistic. It's their driving force, they believe in uh, what they're doing, so, and they Huh. They do what they preach, you know, and that's why they are convincing. Uh, the pessimistic part, of course, is the author of the book because I've seen too much shit, too much mass graves, and been we've been witness to genocides and ecocides that I would be optimistic listening to other people. But I went there with an open heart and came and came out, kind of cured, you know. It's been a beautiful journey, and now I believe in a couple of human beings around. I still hate humanity, of course. <laughs> Present company excluded, of course, right? <clears throat> of course. <laughs> with, with the following 12 people are excluded from I Hate Humanity. Exactly. Everybody. <laughs> um, but um, let's talk about the success of this book, because it's not only the two of us who are fans of it. Um, your dog is clearly a fan of it as well. Um, yeah, you just won an award yourself, and the book just won a very big award. Can you talk a little bit about what just happened in the last week or so, right? Uh, yeah, it happened on Friday, you know, at six o'clock. One of them's a watchdog award. That's what your dog's reacting to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is. <laughs> I have to watch the dog. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, the book has been chosen by the readers, uh, the Slovenian book fair. Uh, it was this year, of course, it was digital, uh, the, the, the fair. Uh, is a book of the year, and it's extremely humbling, you know, because it was the readers, you know, it was not the jury or I don't know, the experts. Um, yeah, it was the readers, you know, people who read the book and it's beautiful, you know, and it's first time that uh, that kind of nonfiction, actually journalistic book has got an award of, you know, the best book of the year. I mean, it's a tremendous, gigantic surprise, not only for me, you know, and yes, it's beautiful. And in the same day, in the evening, it was also uh, one of the, the winners of this year's uh, Journalist Awards. It's called Watchdog, yeah, for the exceptional, exceptional piece of journalism in 2020, yeah. So, that yes, is so cool. lo lots of attention out there. Yeah, it's super cool, but it's also a very aggressive call to the action, you know, uh, because I could be lazy and use it as a trip to ego safari, that would be simple. Um, I will do everything not to do that and to use it for real trips and uh, just continuing with his work and trying also personally to change some habits, you know. So where can people get the English version? What's the easiest way? Uh, the, the, uh, the print version, uh, it's available uh, on the same webpage as the Slovenian version because we have decided to do the print together with the original publisher, Umko. Uh, mm -hmm. We can later, I don't so, know, put English, uh, put the, the, the links in the, it's, uh, sure. the links in it. And the, yeah. uh, for the last couple of days, we already uh, I have the uh, electronic book, the ebook mm -hmm. uh, by Book Baby, and it's published, it's already available on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. But it has okay. a slightly different uh, subtitle. It's not the pioneers of climate uh, in the fight of climate crisis and the video world. It's called uh, "It's Plan B: How Not to Lose Hope in the Times of Climate Crisis." Hmm. Uh, this okay. is capturing the optimistic atmosphere you were uh, talking about. Um, well, it's it's very exciting, Bosch, and I'm so proud of you and so glad that it got the attention it deserves. And anyone who is serious uh, as a citizen of the planet and interested in climate change and what we can do to improve the situation on a personal or larger scale level should certainly read it. Um, and I'm delighted that you shifted your focus um, and in this direction. I was also thinking that you shifted your style a little bit because with these previous books, um, 21st Century Conflicts and this one in particular, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Humanity, um, it's a uh, it's beautifully written, but sometimes harder to read because it's very emotional and you get these zoomed in stories of tragedy. 
Um, but this one is more, um, the term I would use is Brechtian, if we want to be fancy. Um, Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright, it's had this super idea. Super fancy. That, um, <laughs> yeah, that um, people were not responding to issues because of the habit, particularly at the end of the 19th century, to pummel people with overly melodramatic emotions. If you think of things like Les Miserables, these sort of stories that can be beautiful, but they're so upsetting that you sort of want to put up a defensive barrier and hide from mm -hmm. them. And he thought that this was counterproductive. Exactly. And instead he wanted to have a little bit of an emotional distance so that people were aware of things and informed, but not sort of beaten into submission by the awfulness. <laughs> and, um, and it's more of a, a rallying cry to actual, um, to action. And I think that you have taken a Brechtian shift in your writing mm -hmm. and that it is uh, very effective. And if the awards are already demonstrating that it's effective, I can totally understand you getting a book prize from um, uh, authorities and a jury but it's extra cool that you got the voted the best book of the year in Slovenia by readers um, because it's not necessarily the sort of thing you would automatically assume that readers would be excited to vote for. But it was and they were. So, bravo. I'm nearly crying, man. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, all right, yeah. That was exactly my plan. You know what you've said with these words, with the Brechtian, and uh, I wouldn't call it like that. That would be too vain, at least not loudly. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was my direct intention. You know, I, I put it in similar words to my wife when we were discussing the, the project, exactly like that, you know. It's the only way. I don't want to put or throw, push people away from me from the, with the tragic stories. Let's, let's go to something constructive, you know. Let's do something with our knowledge, you know. It's so simple to scream, you know. It's so, it has its consequences. It, the dirt is your body and mind, but... You don't achieve much, you know, so solution-driven journalism is, I think, uh, of the future, I hope. Well, thank you, Boshan, so much for your work and for your time, and it was a pleasure to chat. And um, at some point, we'll hang out in person, but until then, all the best, and all of you should be sure to follow Boshan on social media, his articles, and to go and read his books. And we'll probably put a link in at the end of this interview. So thank you once again and have a good night. Thank you, Noah and everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Noah. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.